quickly go through it. For some of you who know how to keep score and some of the things we're going to cover are going to be real basic and you're going to say, ah, I know that already. But obviously half the hands didn't go up. And so we want to make sure you know how to do the basics and we also want to make sure that what you hand in is, just so you know, going to be the official thing. And so as much as you can, if you do it right to begin with, there'll be no problems afterwards. If you've got your sheets, let's talk first about scorekeepers. Four things just to cover for you that just uh, apply to scorekeeping and a basic understanding of it. Number one, a volunteer from the home team will serve as the official scorekeeper for the game. The home team's job is to provide that scorekeeper every time. And so you'll be able to look at your schedule tonight. If you have a, a manager, if, if your manager's not here, you go home to your manager, say every one of these home games, you need to have an official scorekeeper. You would be wise to have more than one scorekeeper for your team. Because what's going to happen, is, especially if you have children or other responsibilities or they're playing other games, you might not be available and you're going to need someone else. Number two, the official scorekeeper keeps the official record of the game and it cannot be changed so you can't come back later and say oops and so we want to make sure it's right from the beginning and once things are signed and done it kind of becomes the official record and so for the most part we want it to be right to begin with number three the official scorekeeper is a neutral person the official scorekeeper as much as possible should not be back there cheering like crazy for one team <laughs> Okay, I, I know you're going to want to, and when your kid comes up, let's be honest, you're going to cheer for him whether we tell you not to or, you know, so, and that's okay, but you are neutral, which means if you catch something or you're aware of something, whether it be the batting order or anything else, you are not to tell either team. And really what we're telling you is you're not allowed to tell your team because it's the home team supplying it, you obviously have a bias. But you are a neutral party. And so it doesn't matter what you think. If you have a problem with the umpire, you don't get to tell them. If you have an opinion on what should have been done or should have been called, you're just going to sit there quietly with your pencil in your hand because you are neutral. If you want to be one of those, you know, yelling and screaming, going crazy, go sit in the bleachers somewhere, you know, enjoy the game that way. Number four, the official scorekeeper needs to sit behind home plate area and be accessible to the umpire. A lot of people say, why do I have to sit over there? It's because of the second part of that phrase there. You need to be accessible to the umpire. The umpire might need to ask you something, might need to verify something, wants to make sure you recorded something or wrote something down, whatever. You might have a question for them. They do not want to go have to find you. Honestly, if they do, what it does, it wastes the playing time. Your kids are limited in what they can play, and we don't want to waste time doing those kind of things. So you need to be right behind home plate. You can be in your own chair if you want, or there is a, if you haven't been to the field, you'll notice that there's a stone table and a stone kind of bench around it. You're welcome to sit there if you want, or you can sit in your, your beach chair, your folding chair, whatever, um, but you need to be back there and be accessible. That's just kind of four general things. Let's talk a little bit about before the game and how to get ready for the game. This is the nuts and bolts. The first thing is that at least 10 minutes prior to the start of the game, get your clipboard with the official score page. Now that's located with the board members. And the board members sit right next to the snack bar. If you know the snack bar has the open window, there's a door on the side where the employees go in and out. The board typically sets up right next to there. You go to that table, you ask them for a clipboard, they'll give you the clipboard and you'll have a scorecard and that scorecard is exactly what you have in your packet and it'll be front and back, be a visitor team and a home team on each side. The reason we ask you to do it 10 minutes prior and if this is new to you, I recommend you do it 15 or 20 minutes ahead of time. Uh, once you know what you're doing, you can do this in 10 minutes. But when you don't, or that first one or two times, you might want to give yourself a little extra time, and it gives you time to fill out the score page and be ready for the start of the game. There's a lot of things that need filled out ahead of time, and we want to make sure that you're ready to do that. Number two is make sure you have at least one sharp pencil. The league does supply some pencils back at the table, but don't count on it. Always just bring your own to make sure you have one. If they have one, great. You can have that as a backup. Number three, you must get lineup cards from both, man both managers. You must get lineup cards from both managers. Now, those lineup cards, and we're going to show you one in a minute, but those lineup cards must have the player's jersey number, first initial, last name, and who the starting pitcher is. 
That is the only things you really need. If they give you more than that, not a big deal. It's not, it's not, you can't go back and say, change it. it. That doesn't matter. You just need to make sure you have those four things on there. Here's a sample of old ones that they handed out last year. You can see there's two different ones there filled out. They're filled out with everybody's position. In uh, Marina Valley Youth Fed, everybody bats. And everybody has to play every other inning. I think the same for softball. Every other inning, people are switching. And people are switching positions. You, as a scorekeeper, do not need to keep track of people's positions. The only position that matters to you is the pitcher because there are pitching rules. For Shetland, if there's no pitching, you don't have to worry about it. If you have the T-ball on Shetland, they'll play the position of pitcher, but that doesn't matter. We're talking about kids who are actually throwing the ball. You can see on there that uh, one manager wrote on the left-hand side the positions based on their letter or numerical, like second obviously means second base, SS is shortstop. To the right, you see that they use numbers. If that matters to you, you can go look them up, but again, it doesn't matter to you if you're the official. Six, for instance, is shortstop. You know, one is the pitcher. The only number you need to know is one. So a manager might hand you a lineup card, and that lineup card might have the person's name. For instance, my son might say Trent Stewart, and say a one next to it. That means he's going to be my starting pitcher. So you need to record that and be aware of that. Number four. Complete the top portion of the score page and the lineup information for both teams. So once you get the lineup cards, then you need to pull out your score page. And that score page is the other part that's on your sample packet there. And I want us to look at it. We're going to talk about all the different parts you have to fill out, and you can see it. There's two sides to a score page. So we're going to start with the visitor side that has all the basic information at the top. If you see on my thing there, it's starting to fill out all the names at the top. These are the things you need to fill out before a game even starts. You can see at the top it says the division. In this case, I just used our league, and so it says Pony. The visitor team is the Red Sox. The home team is the Yankees. Over there on the left it says the date, and you'll put the date um, that the game is played on. To the right it says the field. All our fields are based on colors, and if you don't know what color it is, look up at the scoreboard. The scoreboard color is the color of the field. And so there's green field, that's for predominantly for pony, I'm talking about for baseball. The yellow field is predominantly for bronco. The blue field is predominantly for mustang, and for all the little ones is predominantly the red field. For softball they tend to play on all of them. Write down the field and then you're going to write down your name under official scorekeeper. You're going to write the visiting manager's name. You're going to put the home manager's name. By the way, both of those will show up on your lineup card. And so there is a spot on the lineup card that says manager's name, so you don't have to memorize everybody's name. If they only put their first name, put the first name on there. That's fine. We know who they are. And then you're going to put the head umpire's name. In this case, it's Tom Cruise. And so uh, <laughs> rock in the house in Moreno Valley, you know, do making it happen. Then you're going to start listing your players. And so I listed four there. You're going to list the whole team. Again, everybody bats. So you list them all in the batting order. You only need to put their number, in this case, 18. Um, the first batter there, his name's Peter, but you don't care. We're just going to put the letter P, their last name, and do that going all the way down. And then notice on the very bottom, it says pitcher, and you're going to record the starting pitcher's name down there as well. Again, their number, first initial, last name. And that's where all the pitching records go. Now, if you were to flip that over, you would see the home side. And on the home side, basically is the same as the other except for the top information. And on this side, you'll see that this is where you track the score at the top. So the visiting team score. And so at the end of every inning, you'd go up there and write it, or you can use little hash marks, however you want to do it, um, that you would know what the score is every inning. Uh, predominantly, you know what the final score is. That's the important one. And that it's written for the right team. Otherwise, you would list the home team there, the pitching the pitcher for the home team, starting team, would be listed on the bottom there. Any questions on this as far as starting the game? We're good? Yes? It also, yeah, the pitcher's name needs to go in the lineup, thank you, because he bats. Because he bats, he's in the order there, but you need to list him separately a second time on the bottom that he's a pitcher of record. If you flip your page over, you'll see that during the game, what do you do? And this is where we'll get to some of your questions there. Number one, you need to record the starting time given to you by the home plate umpire. 
Now listen carefully. You need to record His time. Not the time that you look on your clock, your watch, your cell phone. Doesn't matter. The umpire wants His because that's what He's using. We do that. He meets with the managers ahead of time. Even managers will ask, what's the official starting time? He might say 435 and my phone says 437. Doesn't matter. It's 435. I might look at it and make a mental note for me. I do. Uh, but the umpire's one is the one that goes down. Because later if he asked and there's a question, they're going to say, well, what's the starting time? He says 435. That's what was written. That's what his clock says. His watch says. His cell phone says. So you need to write down what he tells you. That's why you can't do it until game time. And this gets recorded at the top. You can see there the time slot right in the middle, second line. In this case, I wrote 403. And so that gets recorded then. Number two, you need to record any pitching changes during the game. Once a pitcher pitches one pitch, they have officially thrown an inning as far as Marina Valley Youth Federation is concerned. So let me explain to you briefly how that works. We'll go back to our sample. I used real kids. These are kids from my team that have played with me for a couple years. But we wrote down on the bottom there that Alex was our starting pitcher. And so you see there we put an X under the number one in that column. That means he pitched the first inning. The minute he throws a pitch, I can put that X down. It means he's official. He pitched. Then he pitched the second inning, he pitched the third inning. In the third inning, let's say in the middle, he starts melting down, we decide we're going to switch pitchers. And so I go to the mound, and I bring in another pitcher, and the next pitcher I bring in is Trent. He comes in, I record his name on the bottom. Number 11, we put T. Stewart down there. Again, that just refers to back up at the top. We're using the same names. We mark down under three, we mark an X. Even though it's one inning, there's two pitchers who have officially pitched an inning. They both pitched the third. And let's say Trent only throws two batters. His arm hurts or whatever. We brought him in. We want to switch again. We do it again. All of a sudden we have now Peter coming in. And he's going to come in. We mark down underneath the three as well. He came in in the third inning. So we need to mark down when they came in. That makes them the official pitcher of record. The minute they throw a pitch, it's that inning. So even though we're only in the third inning, there's five innings that have been accounted for as far as our pitching. When that gets added up at the end of the week and we look at Trent, for instance, his official record, we'll know that he threw one inning even though he only threw two batters. And so make sure you not only record your pitching, but you mark down this is when they came in and every inning after it. If Peter pitched the rest of the game and we went seven, there'd be an X under the rest. Number three, make sure you start each inning in the appropriate column. This is not a hard thing, but it might just be, uh, for those of you who've never kept score, I've made this mistake about a hundred times because you don't always pay attention, you just start writing again. Number one, I'd make sure you're on the right side. Because a lot of times you're writing, you're doing that, and then you're talking, you're watching your child. Next kid comes up and you just keep going right down the list and you forgot to flip that thing over. But let's go back to our score page. You can see that the columns are numbered at the top. So you've got column one is the first inning, two is the second inning, three is the, the third inning. Some of you have pitching, I mean, uh, have rules in your division where you don't have to worry about going way through the batting order and into another inning. But if that happens, in Pony that could happen. If this team batted through the order and went all the way through the first inning and now are going back up and they're still batting, you would continue it in column two, cross out the two, put a one, cross out the three, put a two. You know, you're going to have to adjust it as you go. Four. This is the biggie. Marino Valley Youth Federation does not care how a runner got on base or how they got out. Simply record that they're on base or they're out. This is where it's really easy because keeping score, this is where it gets difficult. And for those of you who don't know how to keep score, this is, if you're going to go do it for someone else, this is where I want to know where they hit the ball, who threw them out. If there's a rundown, you've got like six numbers in that little box trying to track how that person got out. It can get really confusing. In youth fed, it's not confusing. It's very simple. And so let's go back and track it. A straight line drawn to a base indicates that a runner is on the base. So if you want to know, if I want to look at your paper and say, did that person get on base? I'm going to know just looking at the line. That's all. And here's how it looks. On our sample we've been using, Peter's up first. And so let's say he gets on. He gets on, I draw a line. 
It doesn't matter if he got hit by the pitch, if he walked, if he roped one all the way to the fence, if it was an error, we don't care. We only care that he's on base. That's all you need to worry about. This is, makes it really easy for you. Again, as Larry referred to, we're not keeping the stats. So we don't care if Peter got a hit or if he got on an error. Let's say he got over to second base. We draw another line to second base. Now, maybe he hit a double, and so we just draw a draw. Maybe he got on and stole a base. It doesn't matter. We draw it. Maybe a kid made an error, threw it over the first baseman's head. He got over to second base. We don't care. Do you get the message? Next, an out is recorded by writing the number and the out, either one, two, or three outs, and then circling it. So all you got to do when you have an out is write down the number and then circle it. Back to our sample. Peter's on second base. Alice comes up. He gets out. We don't care how he gets out. We just care that he's out. So we take our pencil. We write the number one. Circle it. Done. Really simple. And then when someone asks, if the umpire turns to you and he says, how many outs are there because he lost track, forgot to hit on his clicker, or a manager like me says, no, there's two outs, then we can go, they're going to turn and ask you, you can look down and say, one, two, I've got those two, they're both circled, I know how many outs there are, there's two of them. So all it is is to help you keep track. We don't care how Alex got out. We don't care if it's your son and you want to record that it was the most beautiful fly ball you've ever seen in your life and the kid got lucky who caught it. None of that matters. Number five, when a runner scores, you need to shade the diamond in completely. So let's go back to our sample page here. Trent's up to bat. Trent is my son, so you know he got a base hit. So uh, I just said that for all the pony managers, Larry. So Trent gets a base hit, which means Peter was on second base. So Peter now starts traveling to third, so we write down that. He comes home, we mark that, and then we fill in the diamond. We shade it. Now the reason you shade it, again, it's really easy to look down. All you got to do is color, count in the colored dots. That's how many, you know how many runs scored that inning. So you just got to look back first inning at the end of the inning. You count them up. You've got two diamonds that are colored in, shaded in. You don't have to worry about how pretty they look. Just shade them. Go back, write two at the top. You know two in the first inning scored. You can see right now looking at the score sheet, if somebody asked you and said how many outs are there, you can glance right now and tell me. One out. If they said, what's the score? You can look. One. Piece of cake, because you're looking up there and you're, you're making the scoring really easy. When you start writing all over it, that's when it gets a little more difficult. Number six, you need to keep track of the balls and strikes. In other words, the count, in case you're asked to verify by the head umpire. So if someone asks you, what's the count? That means they're asking you, what's the balls and strikes? You don't even have to know what a ball and strike is. You just have to listen to the umpire. He says, ball one. It's a ball, all right? If he says strike one or does the, that thing, strike one. Really simple in doing that. You notice that there's a lot of shaded or a lot of boxes uh, on your scorecard. Down to our fourth batter, there's Angel. He's batting, let's say the first pitch is a ball. You'll probably barely see it on there. There's a little X that goes in that top row, the three boxes. Those are for your balls. There's not a fourth because on the fourth ball, what happens? He walks, and so that means he goes to first base. Now that's the one thing I can look at your sheet, count one, two, three, see a line, and probably guess that he walked. He also could have got a hit with three balls. Okay, not a problem. Let's say the next pitch was a strike. That gets recorded in the second row there. There's only two strikes because on the third one is what? An out. He's a strikeout. So then I just write the number, whatever out it is, and circle it. Really simple. And so I only track the three balls, only track the two strikes. I have maybe I'll enter it in the first column. You have um, three <coughs> balls and then two strikes and then what are the bottom two? Yeah, I don't even know why the first column has the other two boxes. <laughs> Typo? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I looked too and I couldn't figure it out so uh, I didn't make the sheet just using it. So. <laughs> Number seven. The most asked question, it's already been asked, it gets asked every time. If someone bats order out of order, it is not your place to mention it. You are neutral. Now, neutral does not mean call somebody over and let them go tell somebody else, okay? Um, that means you don't need to tell anybody. I know how that works. We see it. You know, you don't call your son over and say, Psst, Trent, come here, Trent, come here. 
Go tell the coach. You know, that kind of thing. You are neutral. Your job is just to keep track. You keep scoring it as if nothing ever happened and just keep going through. If something's called into question, they have to call into it right away. They can't come back to it the next inning. So they have to be taken care of right away. If it isn't, the game moves on anyway. It's just how it goes. That's how the rules work. It's not, it's not catch caught by either man. You still put the, uh, the count underneath it. You record it for the next person who's for that person who's batting. Like if we skipped um, on the other thing, if we skipped the third batter and it was the fourth one batting, it just goes under the third batter's name. Because if it came back the next inning, we actually have to start with the same batter again because he's number four. Okay. Yeah. After the game, four things you need to do. Number one, sign your score page at the top. Up on the top right of your visitor side, it says signature. You notice that there's four places for signatures. All our notes at the end are going to talk about signatures. That's pretty much what you've got to do. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to sign it yourself. Can I just suggest to you, double check your paper before you sign it. You're not in a rush anyway. Double check that you write, wrote the right score, that you didn't flip flop it and write the home team won four to three when it was really the visitor team that won four to three. That's prob sometimes the problem when it gets to the website was they wrote the wrong thing um, at the last minute. And so make sure you count it, make sure you wrote it in the right spot, everything's right, pitching changes is right, you have your X's in the right place, sign it. That's your official okie dokie that you've done your job. Number two, you need to have both managers sign your score page indicating the correct score and making sure all the uh, who won. Now, can I suggest to you use basic courtesy and show respect? And, and I'll tell you this is why. Especially if you were in one of those games that was a nail biter down to the end and we're predominantly talking about the older kids. The younger kids, most parents, not all, most parents are like just happy to see the kid running around and throwing a ball somewhere, right? But when it gets older, you're in the heat of the battle, things are tough, maybe you lost a tough game and you just lost it. Maybe it was a, a you felt it was a bad call, the manager did, or somebody else, but you're really excited because your son's team won a crucial game, but you have to go and talk to the manager who's not excited that your son won the crucial game. And so I would just approach them with basic courtesy and respect. I wouldn't approach them going, whoa, that was a great game, coach, you know? That kind of thing. And so here's what I've done. And I've done official scorekeeping for like the Marina Valley Tournament, those kind of things. I'll go up to a manager and I verbally tell him what's on the paper. Hey, I have down here, you, you won four to three. You know, Peter pitched three innings, Alex pitched two innings, Trent pitched one inning. I need your signature right here. Now they don't have to look it all up. They're going, yeah, it was four to three. Yeah, that was my pitchers. Boom. And then you say, hey, thanks a lot. A good game. Well, coach, you guys did well. Whatever you want to say to them, go to the other manager, do the same thing. But just be respectful because you probably don't know this, but all, not all the managers are, you know, real happy after games. So all the signatures come after the game. After the game. Nobody signs until after because we want to make sure it's right. I always check the score because if I sign that it was the wrong score and the other team signs that and they want to argue it, honestly it comes down to what's on the piece of paper. And so I need to verify that that is correct. So my signature verifies that. Number three, you need to get the umpire to sign it. So get the head umpire to in, get the signature of the head umpire indicating the correct score in the winner. And number four, most important, return the score page in the clipboard to the board at the snack bar area. Don't go home with it. Don't tuck it in your little bag. You're so excited that we won, we ran around, and now that's somewhere else. Make sure you get it back to the board and turned in so that we can get it recorded, making that happen, get it on the website, all those kind of things.